There's an association between chronic inflammation of the cervix and HPV, dysplasia, and cervical cancer. This association has actually been known for some time. For example, here's an article um, published in 2001 that found an association with cervical inflammation and high-grade dysplasia. Um, specifically, this study found that um, that the high-grade lesions were associated with increasing levels of cervical inflammation. There was actually about a two-fold increase in that association or that risk. And um, the data suggests that cervical inflammation contributes to the progression of HPV infections to high-grade lesions. And then here's a 2014 publication that uh, their finding was that they found the rate of HPV infection in chronic cervicitis cases was about 90 almost 99% of cases of chronic cervicitis had um, HPV infection. So again, there seems to be an association with um, HPV and, and chronic cervicitis. Here's a more recent a 2017 publication that was um, actually looking for a, a testing a treatment for chronic cervicitis and um, noted in their introduction that chronic cervicitis in patients infected with Persistent HPV has been associated with malignancy evolution has been considered a very important factor for triggering the development of cancer or carcinogenesis. Any inflammation of the cervix is known as cervicitis. Now there's acute cervicitis and chronic cervicitis. This video is about chronic cervicitis and its relationship to HPV and cervical cancer and cervical dysplasia. Acute cervicitis is different. Acute cervicitis is normally associated with um, sexually transmitted diseases like chlamydia and gonorrhea. Um, usually there's more pain associated with it. Um, sometimes there's bleeding, pain with intercourse, changes in vaginal discharge, but things that are more correlated with an actual infection. And the treatment, you know, there's actually treatment for that. So normally the treatment for acute cervicitis probably is going to be some sort of antibiotic. Chronic cervicitis, on the other hand, tends to be asymptomatic. Most women don't know they have um, chronic cervicitis. And when we go through some of the images later in this video, I'll, I'll talk more about it and, and why it is that most gynecologists won't even tell you if you have chronic cervicitis and your cervix could look like a train wreck and the chances are that your gynecologist is actually not going to say anything. So in this video, we're talking about chronic cervicitis. So this is what chronic cervicitis looks like. This is actually... Um, I mean, classic quintessential chronic cervicitis. So if you look at this image, you can see um, the cervix is, is red. You can see blood vessels. You're not supposed to see any of that. The entire cervix should look uniformly pink. So the pink that's off to the kind of side um, on the right side of the cervix, that sort of color, that should be uh, distributed throughout the entire cervix. Where you see those kind of yellow spots, those are cysts. Um, they're old cysts, what are called Nebothian cysts. So a sign of chronic inflammation is having this redness, especially having these blood vessels like this. You'll see evidence of Nebothian cysts. So Nebothian cysts are usually they're fairly small little cysts. When they're new or more recent, they'll show up as little white spots. All the little white spots that you see on there, um, the light's actually reflecting off of these little cysts, and then where you see more yellow um, spots, those are older cysts. Now contrast that to, um, to this. This is actually a very healthy cervix, so this is what your cervix should look like. It's uniformly pink, it's smooth, you're not seeing any cysts or any unusual things. It's, this is, it doesn't get much, uh, cervix doesn't get much healthier looking than this. The fact that there's an association between chronic cervicitis and cervical cancer really is not surprising at all. We've long known that there's an association between probably all types of cancer and chronic inflammation. It's one of the reasons why people adopt what are called anti-inflammatory diets as an attempt to lower systemic inflammation and, and lower the risk of cancer. So we've actually known there's a, a, an inflammatory component to cancer probably since about the 1970s. So this is not any new information and in the fact that there's this relationship between chronic cervicitis and HPV and, and HPV generating cancer is, is not surprising at all. What really is alarming is the fact that you could go to your gynecologist with um, chronic cervicitis and 
as long as you're not complaining any symptoms, if you just go in for your general exam, your doctor does a pap and all of that, and you're not complaining about pelvic pain, and you're not complaining about a change in discharge or anything that would indicate maybe acute cervicitis, your doctor will do your pap, and they'll turn around and say, uh, your cervix looks great, and, and, and we'll wait for the results of the pap. So they won't even say anything about it. Now there's reasons for this. The main reason is that there really isn't any conventional treatment for chronic cervicitis. As I mentioned, with acute cervicitis, you're generally gonna see it's uh, more associated with pain, uh, more acute changes in, in discharge, more discharge. Um, these are signs and symptoms of, of having a sexually transmitted disease. So acute cervicitis is associated with things like chlamydia and gonorrhea, possibly a herpetic outbreak. It can be due to other, other things too, but generally it's going to be a sign of, of, of an infection and there's a treatment for it. The treatment is to take an antibiotic. So most of the time in those cases, you're going to take an antibiotic. However, with chronic cervicitis, it, it's not really due to an infection, at least not an acute infection and your gynecologist doesn't have a treatment for it so they don't they don't want to start a conversation about that i, I think that's one of the reasons why you you don't generally see a um you know gynecologist taking pictures of your cervix and, and letting you see your cervix because if you saw your cervix the chances are you would be um in the event that you had chronic cervicitis you'd be a little bit upset about it and then you'd have all these questions and wonder what you should do about it. And the fact is there's, there's no, there are answers. I mean, there's alternative treatments and there's things that you can do um, for chronic cervicitis. The way I look at chronic cervicitis is sort of as a canary in the coal mine. You know, if you're having inflammation on your cervix like this, there's something wrong. It's not supposed to look like that. But why don't we take um, a look at what actually some additional examples of chronic cervicitis and some of the treatment that I would sometimes do for chronic cervicitis. So uh, as a reference point, this is again what a healthy cervix looks like. It's pink, it's um, smooth, there's no lesions anywhere, it looks, looks great. So just keep that in mind, that's what a normal cervix should look like. And then um, again, you contrast that to, um, to this, which is pretty, pretty classic um, chronic inflammation or chronic cervicitis. I mentioned Nabothian cysts. This this is somebody that I treated a handful of years ago. Now, most of the images I'm going to be showing you are patients that also had HPV and cervical dysplasia. So I was treating them mainly for HPV and cervical dysplasia. There were some women over the years that I've seen just for annual exams and things like that where they might have had chronic cervicitis. And some of those I ended up treating for the cervicitis alone, but uh, probably 95% of the time and, and probably 95% of these images that I'm going to be showing you are actually women who also had HPV and cervical dysplasia and were treated for that. So this case is like the mother of all cysts. Uh, these are Nabothian cysts all on the bottom here. They're huge. So some of the little shiny spots, again, are, are really tiny, small cysts uh, that are probably going to grow and expand. These ones that are a little bit more lighter in color, kind of yellowish or, or older, but these are just ginormous. Again, we're seeing some of the signs of inflammation here, seeing some blood vessels, not a lot of redness. Now, again, with acute cervicitis, it would be like angry, red, and more sensitive. Um, so that's, and those cases, as I said, are more likely to involve taking something like an antibiotic. Now, if we, you know, if we compare this to after, so I treated this person, like I said, for cervical dysplasia. This is her after just um, two treatments with a cervical escharotic. So I used an escharotic solution on her to treat the dysplasia. She was flying in from out of town. So usually I'll do two treatments in a row, like in two days, and then do that about once a month. So this is the very first time I saw her on the right. I did uh, two applications of the solution in two days. This on the left is after the next time I saw her. So about a month later, it looked like this. So the escharotic treatment actually is, is most of the time it's really effective for treating chronic cervicitis. Most of the time it, it takes a little bit longer than this. This was just so s dramatic in, in just a matter of two treatments to have the cyst pretty much gone and most of the inflammation gone was just shocking. But I went on to treat her probably about another, you know, seven or eight times for the dysplasia. So that's a great example of um, of just Nabothian cysts. And then here we see an example of just again basic sort of uh, chronic inflammation. This one's a little bit more red, but again, you can see how it's all kind of granular. The surface is not 
is not real regular. Uh, her again, I was treating for, um, you know, for dysplasia. And this is, you know, this is when we were done. So after I did about 10 treatments, um, you know, her dysplasia was gone and the HPV was negative, but also as a benefit, the cervicitis was resolved. This is somebody actually that I, um, I just started working with overseas. I think she sent me this picture about three days ago. Um, for some women, I'll oversee their treatment and um, guide them through the process. So these are her images af at the first treatment. So again, you know, it's red, it's inflamed. You can see little blood vessels. Um, you can see a few little white spots, which are some of the cysts. It's just an are areas that are uneven. It just doesn't look very healthy. And she has uh, CIN3. So like I said, we just started treatment. So we'll see how that's progressing over time. Here's a case of um, another little bit more red. Again, you're seeing some veins and some blood vessels. It's uneven, granular looking. Um, just doesn't look very healthy. Here is a case um, after having a leap. So I've said in other videos, most of the time, you know, women tend to tolerate leaps fairly well. And my main issue is just, I don't think it's the most effective way to treat cervical dysplasia and HPV. Some women get side effects and there can be problems. In this case, there's deformity. Uh, this was probably a little bit more aggressive leap that was done. And, and as a result, the cervix is, uh, it never, you know, it never healed completely and properly. And it's, so it's a little bit deformed, but there's also cervicitis here. So this is a giant cyst right in the middle here. There's some little cysts above it and a couple little cysts below. It's red. It's a little bit inflamed and she has dysplasia. So not only um, does she still have chronic cervicitis, but um, the leap didn't adequately get rid of everything. Um, she still had HPV after the leap. And if you have you know, if you have moderate or severe dysplasia and you do a leap and you don't get rid of the virus, you know, you've already demonstrated that you're having a problem with the virus. So of course it's going to come back. You know, the dysplasia is going to come back if the virus isn't gone. That just, that just makes sense. Um, here's another case, just run of the mill, chronic, chronic inflammation, chronic cervicitis, her, her I treated, and uh, this is just after five treatments. So this was at the time of the first, again, she had dysplasia and HPV. This is at the time of the first treatment on the right. And then after five treatments, it looked like, so I mean, it can be pretty dramatic. Part of it just depends on how angry looking it is. The more red and, and the more, you know, cysts you see, it usually it takes a little bit longer. So this again is a case where it ended up responding pretty quickly. I didn't finish treatment with her after five treatments because I was treating the dysplasia. I ended up, um, you know, doing more treatments to get rid of the HPV and the cervical dysplasia. Here's a case that's a little bit more angry looking. She had a really severe cervical dysplasia. Actually, actually, this is her here. Um, so this is at the time of the first treatment. This is what her cervix looked like on the left. There's you know, clearly there's inflammation there. I mean, some of this is almost getting to the point of being slightly acute. It's just so red. Um, and there, there again, there's some little cysts, but you can really see how uneven it is when you look at um, the image after the escharotic solution was applied. So again, this was at the first treatment. She had a, this was starting to become in situ carcinoma. Actually, it was like a severe, severe dysplasia, severe CIN three and um, which can cause some deformity and some irregularity in the surface and with the staining that the solution provides the treatment solution it ends up you can really see uh, the unevenness in, in everything but um, her cervix I think I got that over here her cervix yeah it looked like that after I ended up treating her I think 13 or 14 times so this was actually after 12 treatment so her sir and this is yellow because i have the treatment solution on it but you can see that that unevenness went away and the redness is all gone so her cervicitis is cleared up and she, at the time you know when we were done with treatment she was hpv negative and all her dysplasia was gone also this is a um this is an interesting case um this is somebody who had a leap you know, you can tell it's just there's it's so 
it's too even, you know, the edge of this. Well, this is from a leap. So she had a leap about two years prior to this and the dysplasia came back. So there's dysplasia here. Also, this I wouldn't consider as necessarily being a great example of inflammation or chronic inflammation. I guess I just kind of threw this in because it's just really bizarre, the fact that you ended up with this tissue like this um, from, you know, from the leap. Now, her after I was done with treatment looked like that. So it's a pretty, um, you know, pretty dramatic change from, from the right to the left. And her, she was HPV negative and the dysplasia was gone by the time we were done with treatment. You know, sometimes I get questions um, about whether escharotics can cause scarring and things like that or whether there's side effects. And the escharotics themselves, if they're done properly, will not cause any scarring. And the reality is it can actually get rid of scarring and clear up some things. So this is a dramatic example where her cervix just look just not right you know two years after so i mean this is completely healed this is two years after a leap and yet after doing a round of escharotic treatment her cervix looked like a new cervix so it's it can be pretty dramatic um at times and then i think this is probably my last example now i went through about maybe several hundred um, of, of images several hundred patients and images so i was just pulling out some of the more dramatic ones I could sit here all day pulling out examples of of chronic inflammation of varying degrees is is so common. So this again is after a leap. You can you know you can see that the cervix is all uneven and you know because a big piece of tissue was cut out here. And now there's still some inflammation. Her dysplasia came back. Um, the HPV is still there. I think I have an after. Oh, this is after four treatments. So after just four treatments with an escharotic, most of the area had smoothed out. So if you look at the, you know, sort of this, where the, the tissue was excised, it's almost gone. I mean, it shrunk down and the, the edges are starting to smooth out. Um, so it's starting to look more normal. But just after, after four treatments, most of the inflammation was gone and the cervix was starting to look, um, it, it sort of resurfaces. So one of the benefits of doing repeated applications with an escharotic is that the areas that are abnormal will slough off and, you know, you'll have an inflammatory process, which is going to end up um, helping to resurface the area and to help, you know, help get the shape of it back to what it should have been originally. So that's pretty dramatic change there also. Now, this is important. Anyone who has HPV or cervical dysplasia or is concerned about HPV absolutely needs to know whether you have chronic cervicitis. Just because your doctor hasn't said anything to you about it means absolutely nothing. Doctors will not say anything about chronic cervicitis. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in my office, you know, after doing the initial treatment on somebody with uh, dysplasia, where we're looking at the images and the before image, looking at the cervix that looks like a train wreck, and 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 the patient, you know, looking at it with kind of speechless because she had just seen her gynecologist maybe two weeks prior who did the PAP and, you know, who said, your cervix looks great. So I've literally been sitting there in my office where I'm talking to the patient the very first time, you know, relaying to me the, her office visit with her gynecologist who said, oh, your cervix looks really healthy. And then we put the image up on, on the computer and we're looking at it and it's like, looks awful. She has chronic inflammation, chronic cervicitis, and invariably asks, you know, well, why didn't my doctor tell me this? I don't understand. They're not gonna tell you anything because there's no treatment for, chronic cervicitis. In fact, if you Google um, chronic cervicitis or say Google symptoms of chronic cervicitis, everything that shows up is going to be for acute cervicitis. So here you look at this. Um, these are all symptoms of acute cervicitis. Every, everything that's here, every link is all for ser acute cervicitis. And then if you pull up a link here for cervicitis, you know, all the symptoms are associated. It's all talking about acute cervicitis. There's nothing about chronic cervicitis, even though I actually did a specific search on chronic cervicitis. So everyone needs to know whether they have chronic cervicitis. So what are the symptoms of chronic cervicitis? Probably nothing. You're probably not going to have any symptoms with chronic cervicitis because the chances are that the cervicitis has been there for so long that if you're having any symptoms associated with it, you're, you're just not going to know it. Now that you know, that, that contrasts acute cervicitis because with acute cervicitis, it's, it's acute. It's, 
it's sudden or recent generally, like with a sexually transmitted disease, chlamydia, gonorrhea, a herpetic outbreak, um, some type of bacterial infection. There's other types of bacterial infections you can have that are not sexually transmitted. Uh, generally, there's gonna be pain and, and pain with intercourse, sometimes bleeding. Although you'll see that's a symptom, that is a symptom of chronic cervicitis at times is to have a little bit of bleeding. Sometimes you'll see, you know, just bleeding at different times of the month that you shouldn't. Um, or you'll have some pain with intercourse or maybe a little bit of bleeding with intercourse. That might be the only symptoms that you see with chronic cervicitis. There can be an associated increase in discharge or a change in discharge, but again, chronic cervicitis, because it's chronic, because it's been there a long time, you're usually not going to pay any attention. It's just going to become your normal sort of discharge and you're not going to realize that actually the discharge has changed. Now, anytime there's inflammation, anywhere on any mucosal surface, you're going to have an increase in, in secretions or an increase in, in mucus-like production. Now that mucus-like production vaginally, if you're having cervicitis, is going to change the environment. It's going to change the food that's available for the bacteria that are there, and you're going to see a shift in the vaginal microbiome. But, <clears throat> but again, um, most women, it's just become part of their background noise, so you're not even going to realize it. Now, some women who have chronic and like bacterial vaginosis, you know, what seem to be just sort of this chronic dysbiosis or, or imbalance in the bacteria or the flora that are there, sometimes that's because they actually have a chronic cervicitis. So that's another thing that you need to look at if you're having what seems to be an imbalance or you're more prone to bacterial vaginosis, you need to determine whether you, whether you have chronic cervicitis. So how do you know that? There's a couple things you can do. One, if you're going to be seeing your gynecologist, you can always ask your gynecologist to take a picture. Don't rely on your gynecologist to just tell you verbally because most of the time they're not going to say anything. Guaranteed. So you can have them take a picture if they're willing to take a picture. Some gynecologists will take a picture. Um, some won't because again, if you actually see your cervix, often it'll end up prompting a, a million questions and you know, in their defense, you know, what a, what a conventional gynecologist is thinking is their justification for kind of lying to you, or at least it's lying by omission, the reason why they're not telling you you have chronic cervicitis, is because they, they feel justified that there's no treatment for it. So in their mind, it's kind of like, well, there's no treatment for it, so, you know, why, why worry about it? So they think they're doing you a favor by just, um, you know, by, by removing anything that's going to end up causing you stress. But the reality is, especially if you're having HPV related problems, you need to know this because you need to, you need to address it and it makes it more likely that you're going to develop severe dysplasia and or cancer. So you can ask your gynecologist to take a picture um, or you can do it at home. So if you don't have an appointment with your gynecologist anytime soon, what you can do is you can do use this. So you can check yourself. Now this is a vaginal speculum. This happens to be a Welsh Allen disposable speculum. Welsh Allen makes the um, hands down the best disposable specula. Now you can actually order these on Amazon. You can't order the Welsh Allen um, because you have to be a healthcare provider to get them. But on Amazon, they have sort of like knockoffs that are the same sort of style. The disposable are really nice and these Welsh Allen are really nice because they have they have an adjustable um, that, that works really well, like for, op for opening where the cervix would normally sit. So normally the cervix would sit here and they also have an adjustable on the handle that can um, vary the size of the opening. Um, also, the, these types of Welsh Allen to Specula, they have a, um, a slot in the handle where normally the light would go into that. So like I have this really expensive uh, rechargeable light that slides into the handle here but you can also put a pen light into the handle here and illuminate the cervix when you're looking at it. So what I'm getting at is you can order on Amazon or any or somewhere else for that matter, a speculum and you can actually look yourself. So using a mirror, you know, you can put a lubricant on this. You can find your cervix, go in the direction of your cervix, open this up, look at your cervix. And as long as you have proper lighting and you use a mirror, you can actually find your cervix. It's most of the time it's not that difficult. And then you can take a picture of your cervix and then you'll see whether you have um, any chronic inflammation or not. Now, the most, the most important thing if you're going to do something like this and, and use a speculum to take a look at your own cervix is um, the light source. So you wanna make sure that you have a proper light source. Um, the size light that goes into the handle here, if you use a pen light, 
and you, a pen light, like just a general nursing pen light um, or doctor's pen light, it needs to have a diameter of 0.47 inches or 1.2 centimeters. That'll fit into the handle perfectly, works really well. Um, that's probably the best way to do it. Now, to take a picture, if you don't have good lighting, you're not gonna be able to take a good picture. Their Android um, smartphones actually, I guess you can use the flashlight function with the camera. So then you have a light and you can, because if you can't, if the camera can't see your cervix properly, it's not gonna be able to focus on it and you're gonna get a terrible picture. So you need to have some lighting sufficient to be able to, for the camera to focus on your cervix. Now, iPhones don't allow you to use the flashlight function with the camera mode, so you're gonna need some sort of light source um, to be able to find the cervix, but that's my recommendation, is take, take a picture of your cervix, see what your cervix looks like. If there's any, any doubt about it, um, you know, my, my information's in the, um, you know, the video information or description below, and you can simply reach out to me and you know, I'll take a look at it and tell you whether you have cervicitis or not. I do um, telemedicine con, uh, consultations, so if you're concerned about it and you want to do treatment for it and, and some of the things, I'm going to discuss later in this video, you know, what you should do if you have chronic cervicitis and how to treat it. How do you treat cervicitis? Well, first of all, you need to make sure that you have chronic cervicitis and not acute cervicitis. If you have acute cervicitis, you need to be treated for that. The chances are you may need to take an antibiotic. So if you're having any weird symptoms, you think you might have acute cervicitis, then you need to see your doctor and maybe do a, a check for STDs or other types of infections. You may need to take an antibiotic. Um, if you don't have acute cervicitis, if you don't have an infection or, or any sexually transmitted disease and you have chronic cervicitis, then you wanna do, how you treat it depends on the circumstances. If you have HPV, and especially if you have HPV and cervical dysplasia, then you need to do escherotic treatment. Escherotic treatment is the best treatment um, to deal with both. It's the best treatment to get rid of the cervical dysplasia and the HPV, and at the same time, um, it's gonna get rid of the chronic cervicitis. If you don't have um, HPV or cervical dysplasia, then I wouldn't necessarily do an escherotic treatment. I mean, there may be reasons to do an escherotic treatment you know, I didn't mention this a lot in the video, but if you have chronic cervicitis, it probably makes you more likely that you're going to get an HPV infection. You know, I've talked about this in other videos, just because you're exposed to HPV doesn't mean that you get HPV. There's a lot of factors that determine whether you're actually going to get an HPV infection. And one of them is probably the health of your cervix and whether you have chronic inflammation or, or acute inflammation for that matter. If you have inflammation there, it just provides an entryway for the virus to get into the cells and to infect them. So the chances are probably pretty good that a chronic cervicitis or any type of cervicitis is gonna make it more likely that you have HPV. So if you have just chronic cervicitis by itself, it shouldn't be there. So I mean, I, I would treat it. I, I wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, advocate doing an escherotic, a round of escherotic treatment just for chronic cervicitis, but you certainly do that. And I've done that with patients before to clear up chronic cervicitis, um, you know, in part just to make the cervix healthy because it shouldn't, it shouldn't be chronically inflamed and also to help prevent possibly future um, HPV infections. If you, again, if you don't have HPV or dysplasia, well then, and I would use, I would do the same thing though in, in either case, whether you have HPV and cervical dysplasia or whether you don't, but you have chronic cervicitis, there's some systemic things I would do. So the first thing I would do is try to determine why you're having chronic cervicitis. I'd look at gut function, um, local vaginal um, environment, whether you're getting chronic infections and BV and imbalances and bacteria and things like that, then that should all be addressed. That's not always, you know, it's easy in theory to try to address but it's not always easy in practice to try to figure that all out. But as I mentioned earlier, I view chronic inflammation of the cervix as, as the canary in the coal mine, and it may indicate some more systemic inflammatory issues. So I would adopt a plant-based diet or an anti-inflammatory type diet. A plant-based diet is gonna make it less likely that you have chronic inflammation. It's also gonna change your um, intestinal microbiome in a favorable way. And if you do that, you're gonna end up changing your vaginal microbiome also in a favorable way. So I would adopt a plant-based diet. And then as far as some of the supplements that I would take, I would do um, an omega-3 fatty acid, preferably an ocean source, so either fish oil or an algal source of omega-3s. 
mainly because ocean source omega-3s are going to be high in DHA, whereas something like flax seed oil is not going to be, it's not going to have DHA, it's going to be high in EPA, and you want to be doing some DHA as well. And then other types of anti-inflammatory type um, supplements, I would recommend, normally I recommend turmeric or curcumin, um, makes sense, probably a good, um, a good probiotic and I have another video where I talk about spore-based probiotics as being probably one of my more favorite probiotics. And then you can also do um, local treatment. Now again I have another video on, on my thoughts on vaginal suppositories and this is something whereas when the suppositories were available there used to be some companies that made some really nice vaginal suppositories I would probably at least for women having chronic cervicitis without HPV I would maybe try a round of some different types of uh, vaginal suppositories, but they're not, there's not too many that are available anymore. You can make them yourself though. So in the event that you don't have HPV, I would, I would either make or try to find some online, some, some anti-inflammatory type suppositories and do a round of those while doing some oral treatment and some more systemic treatment at the same time. But again, if, if you have HPV and especially if you have dysplasia, then the easiest way to treat it is just to do escharotic treatment. If you found this video helpful or useful, please share it and click the like tab below. And, and if you want future videos like this um, or content, just subscribe to my channel.